Welcome. Thank you for joining our Laboratory Compliance Best Practice Series webinar. I'm Becky Melody, your hostess for today's presentation. Our featured speaker is Diane Gleinzer, USDM's VP of Operation and leader of our laboratory practice. The discussion today will cover introductions, USDM at a glance, webinar logistics, and our presentation topic, Guidelines for Good Laboratory Practices in Life Sciences. Diane Gleinzer, as I mentioned, is the Vice President of Operations for U.S. Data Management. She has 23 years' experience in quality assurance and regulatory compliance within pharmaceutical, biotech, and medical device industries. Her background is in GLP laboratories, QA and QC, auditing, project management, and overall regulatory compliance. Diane is our Lab Practice Director, and she leads the USDM Operations Team and has done so successfully for 11 years now. USDM is focused exclusively on the life science domain. We're the market leader in providing IT, quality and regulatory compliance, professional service solutions to the regulated industry. We're headquartered in Ventura, California. We're a compliance partner for many best-of-breed vendors, including Oracle, SAP, Sparta Systems, and Agilent Technologies. We've delivered more than 1,000 successful projects with over 130 life science clients, and we're the preferred compliance partner for small, mid-tier, and large life science companies. We specialize in assisting clients with reducing regulatory risk while maximizing their investment in compliance objectives. Our various dedicated practices include IT and virtualization, quality and auditing, enterprise content management, enterprise resource planning, product lifestyle, excuse me, life cycle management, enterprise quality management, manufacturing automation and equipment, clinical and drug safety, nutraceuticals, which is 21 CFR Part 111, business intelligence, project management, our GRC, and of course, our laboratory practice, which includes both limb systems and equipment compliance. The content of today's presentation will be covered in approximately 30 minutes, and then you can interact with our team via the iLink message board found on the lower left of your screen, or you can join the discussion on LinkedIn and post any questions there. Of course, if your question is confidential, uh, we're happy to address that directly offline. This session is being recorded and will be posted to the U.S. Data Management website. Keep in mind that the overall goal of today's webinar is to facilitate discussion, share ideas, and then explore solutions together. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. And now we'll turn the presentation over to Diane. Thank you, Becky. So in today's webinar, we're going to be looking at an overview of good laboratory practices as they stand today. The applicability, when are they applicable and when don't you have to comply with GLP? Basics and the key requirements for good laboratory practices and what happens, what are, what are the potential um, penalties if you fail to comply with GLPs and you're required to comply. So let's start out with a brief overview and find out what good laboratory practices really are. Good laboratory practices, or GLP, is a quality system that provides a framework within which non-clinical health and environmental safety studies are planned, performed, monitored, recorded, reported, and archived. So basically, it's a quality system for laboratories, again, non-clinical health and safety studies. The GLPs are actually formal regulations, which means that they are a law, a series of laws that govern the safety and efficacy of human and veterinary drugs and devices and the safety of food and color additives created by the FDA, U.S. Food and Drug Administration, in 1978. That was the final rule. Um, this is, they're also known as 21 CFR Part 58. They have a worldwide impact. If you work, if you are a non-U.S. company and you wish to do business in the United States, 
you need to comply with Part 11 if you are required to comply with it. So in other words, as we said, for the non-clinical health and safety studies. Um, in 1981, the OECD, or the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, produced GLB principles that are, are used throughout um, Europe, and they be, have become an international standard. So to, in today's webinar, there are other uh, regulations that apply, there are ISO standards that could apply, CLIA could apply, but for today's webinar we're going to be discussing mainly OECD and the FDA's GLPs. Until the mid-70s, the FDA pretty much assumed, as did the EPA, that reports and data submitted by sponsors were, cons were largely accurate. But in mid-1970s, 1975, the FDA, during an inspection of Searle Laboratories, um, whose laboratories conducted toxicology testing, found sloppy work, personnel that were not trained, poor data collection and analysis practices, that test results were actually being omitted, they didn't like them, um, and there was inadequate review overall of the data and the reports that were generated that the FDA was depending on. At that point in time, the FDA set forth good laboratory practices and distributed them to the industry for voluntary um, compliance. So they weren't really a law at that point. They were mainly a guideline for scientists to adhere to um, so that they could improve the quality of their data. Between 75 and 78, additional issues were found, specifically with Biometric Testing Inc. and Industrial Biotest, where it was found during inspections that they actually falsified test procedures and data, that they fraudulently reported their test results, they did not have adequate environmental controls in their facilities, they had very poor animal tracking. Some animals were dead and they were not noted. Um, some animals were missing, escaped from their cages. And it rendered the study data generated as unusable. In 1978, mainly based on these examples, the G GLP was promoted to law as 21 CFR Part 58. Excuse me, just an overview here. So. As you look at this drug development um, timeline, if you will, basic research, disease discovery, drug discovery, those are not regulated functions under the GLP. GLP starts to become um, something that you must adhere to in the preclinical development space in the timeline. Once you actually get to clinical trials in human beings, we're looking at good clinical practices taking over. And once you're actually manufacturing drugs, now you're looking at good manufacturing practices. 21 CFR Part 11, which is the regulation that extends the, the predicate rules around ensuring that even your paper-based systems, that the processes you use work the way you intend them to, 21 CFR Part 11 simply extends those regulations to computerized systems. And as you can see, it covers good laboratory practices, good clinical practices, and good manufacturing practices. So really, as you move forward in the timeline, study-based um, or, or study discovery-based studies that GLPs kick in and then become more process-based. So GLP is, at, is required for certain types of studies. It's required for non-clinical safety studies conducted in drug development. And this covers studies, whether they're done in a laboratory, in an animal facility, in a greenhouse, or out in the field. It covers analytical laboratories to the extent that they supply data generated for these studies, these types of studies, or for submission. If with certain products, microbial testing that's done for the purpose of obtaining information on neoplastic and mutagenic activity should be conducted in accordance with the GLPs. It also covers such things as agricultural pesticide development, any development of toxic chemicals, food control, food additives, 
and testing of substances with regard to explosive hazards, which is my favorite part of it. Um, it's not needed for basic research. So as you're doing your preliminary studies for basic research, basic molecule research, you don't need to follow GLPs. Um, studies that are developed, studies that are intended to develop new analytical methods are not subject to GLPs. Chemical tests used to derive the specifications of a marketed food product um, are not subject to GLPs, and actual clinical studies must comply with GCP and ICH, not GLPs. The objective of GLPs is to ensure that the data that are submitted are a valid reflection of the results that are obtained during a study to ensure that we can get that data again, so we can trace back to it. We can link the data to the study and to the people that it was obtained from, or the animals, or whoever generated that data. And this helps to promote international acceptance of test data supplied in INDs and NDAs. Again, the intent is to ensure that we're generating and verifying reliably the data that is, con that is produced in a study, ensuring that, we, that you can have confidence in that reported data. To ensure data integrity, the following elements of GLP really need to be in place, and we'll go through each one of these in a bit more detail. You have to have standard operating procedures that tell you how to do what you're doing. You need statistical procedures for how you evaluate and analyze data. You need to make sure that your equipment is in a state of control. You need training, education, and where possible, certification of the people who actually generate that data. They need to understand and know what they're doing. The facilities that you're using either to conduct a study or to analyze the data need to be sufficient for that intended use. And you need to have adequate tracking of your samples and specimens so that you can have a chain of custody. You understand that you're actually, that the data that you're reporting is actually for the sample that you said it was generated for. So looking at each one of these in just a bit more detail, standard operating procedures, we all know what those are, we all hate them, but they are documented procedures that you've verified and you've actually approved to ensure that you conduct specific processes and determinations the same way. If you've ever had, you know, people don't have um, standard operating procedures in a lot of cases. A lot of my clients don't have them. And that's kind of like folklore. You're just passing things down from one generation to another. And if you've ever played the telephone game, you know that once you tell somebody something, they interpret it a little bit differently, and they're going to pass it down a little bit differently to the next person. So after a few generations of the telephone game, people are not doing things in the same manner that they were originally designed to be done. So having a formalized test protocol for how you conduct a, your protocol-specific activities ensures or helps to ensure that your data generated is reliable and can, can be consistently obtained um, you want to develop your SOPs so that any analytical data that's collected and reported can be tied to that documented process. Again, we want to be able to reproduce the data that we've generated under certain conditions. I, for statistical pro procedures, you can't just choose a statistical procedure from a textbook. Many of the procedural details are optional and or arbitrary, and the scientist who develops that procedure the guy or the, the woman who has the most knowledge in that specific area can adopt certain standards that are deemed acceptable within their field. We want those procedures to be used over and over again. Again, statistics is one of those fields where you can, it's easy to use the same set of statistics to show different, um, different points. So you want to make sure that you're using the same procedure reliably, consistently, and therefore you want it documented so that other people besides just the scientists doing it can follow it consistently. Um, you might get acceptable statistic procedures also from regulatory agencies. Equipment that's used in the generation of any data or in the measurement or assessment of data, equipment used for facility environmental controls, needs to be designed appropriately and have adequate capacity to function as intended. And you need to document that it does. 
Data produced by instruments that are not in control may very well look as though it was it's good data. But unless that system is under control and has been tested and shown that it's going to work the way you want it to, you can't rely on that data. You need to adequately inspect, you need to clean, and need to maintain your, your laboratory instrumentation and equipment under certain procedures, on certain periodic uh, periodicities, so that you can trust that system to be in calibration. If it's in calibration, you can show over time whether or not it's moving in or out of range. Um, you can show a lot of things. So you want to make sure that you're consistently cleaning and maintaining, calibrating the equipment as required. Talked about instruments being under control. What does that mean? First of all, you want to validate the equipment, <laughs> excuse me, to show that the instrument itself and any software that you're using work the way they're expected to work. That's really a good business practice. Why would you spend all your time generating this data on a piece of equipment that doesn't work? You need to calibrate and maintain your equipment as recommended by the manufacturer based on the instrument itself how you use it in the laboratory, how often you use it, and the purpose of its use. The systems must be under formal change control. As changes are made to a system, other people should know about them. Different, different scientists may use the same piece of equipment for different purposes. So one scientist needs to know what the other ones are doing with that equipment. So under formal change control means you're not arbitrarily making changes to the system that other people aren't aware of and have input on. Um, and you need to track and trend controls that are generated from the equipment, um, maintenance data, calibration data, so that you can actually show over time whether or not your system is developing a problem before the problem actually occurs. Tracking and trending the data generated really allows you to exert certain controls over the system and understand when it may or may not be time to recalibrate, reclean, or have preventive maintenance done. Need written state, uh, operating procedures that detail the methods, materials, and schedules used to inspect, clean, maintain, test, calibrate, and or standardize your equipment. Again, you want remedial action. This is showing a state of control. Those procedures ensure as it's important to have the procedures. It's also important to follow those procedures regularly, to train to those procedures, so that you're treating the equipment in a consistent manner, thereby allowing you to rely on the data that's generated. So you're contributing to data integrity when you conduct these processes. Um, you want your procedures to state if a system goes out of calibration, if a system fails for some reason, what is the failure that could happen, and what remedial action will you take? Do you call the vendor right away? Do you bring in a system owner? The, re the remedial action needs to be specified and maybe even the degree. So if it's one thing, you would call the system owner. If it's this, you'd call the vendor. Um, and who's responsible to perform each operation on the system? It's important. It doesn't just need to be a name of a person, but there should be a role within your organization of the, the person who's responsible for making sure this system is under control. Reagents and materials used in testing need to be managed by documented accepted procedures. If you have reagents and materials in your lab, they need to be appropriately labeled with the date prepared and who prepared it, if it's a mixture, um, the expiration date, based on documented stability information or the manufacturer's stability information, what the material is, what concentration is it, what are the storage requirements, how about a lot number, other identification. You can trace back to the documentation where either you prepared this, this solution or you can trace it back to the manufacturer lot number itself. When applicable, for, for containers that you have, um, just the chemical containers, and you've just opened them and you use them out of the original container, you also need to include the date the reagent was opened. Need to have policies and procedures in place to ensure that deteriorated or outdated reagents and solutions are not used in laboratory without sufficient stability testing. So you can have, do additional testing to 
to ensure that that material is still good, and then you would put the new expiration date on it. But if a, if a reagent or solution is out of its expiry, it should not be used in your day-to-day -day testing. The reagents and materials that you use need to be stored within the manufacturer's recommended temperature range. Don't leave things out of the refrigerator for longer than recommended. And there should really be materials data safety sheets readily available to personnel who may come in contact with any hazardous materials. Analysts need to be trained to do their job. And that training can be formal training and education. It can be on-the-job training. It can be past experience or any combination of those things that shows that they are capable of performing the job that they are assigned. And that should be documented in their training records so that anyone can tell at a glance what people are, are trained to do. Job descriptions should be created for every role within the company to, to detail what is the required training and knowledge, what, what's required for this position. You need to have sufficient personnel to ensure timeline and proper conduct of a study according to your protocol. Your facilities need to be adequate when you're either conducting the protocol, whether it's in a greenhouse, whether it's in your laboratory, um, for conducting clinical trials or, or preclinical trials, animal facilities, they must be adequate to conduct the business. There must be a suitable size and construction um, so that you can conduct your non-clinical lab studies. The GLP governs animal care facilities and animal supply facilities, ensuring that you can adequately track, hum um, track your animals, ensuring that the animals are humanely cared for. Um, GLPs govern facilities for how you handle test and control areas. This could be test and control drugs, test and control animals so that you're preventing contamination and mix-ups. It also governs specimen and data storage facilities to ensure that storage and retrieval of all raw data and or specimens from any particular study can be retrieved on a, in a timely manner. Tracking of specimens and samples is just an absolutely critical part of the GLPs, and it's a critical part of your quality function whether you track this on paper records or you track these electronically. You must ensure that you maintain that connection between your set of analytical data and the original specimen or samples that that data was obtained from. The or original source of the specimen and sample needs to be recorded and unmistakably connected with your analytical data. Final reports must be prepared for each non-clinical lab study that, that meet the rules and regulations that are established in the, in the law itself. We're not going to go into a lot of those details here. The law is fairly specific about this. Um, and that's if we wanted to go into more detail, feel free to get a hold of me outside of this webinar. Uh, raw data, documentation, protocols, final reports and specimens with a very few exceptions of some biohazardous um, specimens that are generated as a result of the non-clinical lab study need to be retained. The archives must be available to ensure the ability to get the raw data or documentation or reports, specimens in a very timely manner. So it, it needs to be organized in such a manner that you can go back and know where these things are. Um, you need a policy or procedure in place for record retention for all study documentation and specimens. When can you actually destroy the specimens? And there are some rules that are set within the, the regulation itself. So what happens if you don't meet the guidelines? I've had the, the range of things from clients saying, I'll never get caught, to clients who go to the nth degree to try and avoid noncompliance. There's a, 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 an escalating series of events that can happen. First thing that can happen if you're found in noncompliance is an investigation. The second thing that can happen is if, you, if you're, the investigation shows you're not complying, you're probably not going to comply in a timely manner, you can be issued a warning letter. And finally, if you are not in compliance with a warning letter, you're not making an effort to comply, then you can actually be disqualified as a lab 
for conducting clinical studies or non-clinical studies. Common grounds for disqualification is a testing facility that fails to comply with one or more of the, st the statutes set out in the GLPs. Um, if those non-compliances adversely affect the validity of your study data. There are lesser regulatory actions that can be implemented. Um, in, you know, they, they really haven't found that issuing the lesser regulatory actions really helps in compliance unless the company is just really motivated to comply. Um, some common areas of non-compliance. Laboratory equipment, calibrations not documented, no processes or procedure for how you calibrate or you're not following your procedures. Um, not documenting uh, preventive maintenance activities according to your procedures, not having procedures. And lab equipment that's not been validated, qualified, has not had preventative maintenance form or performed um, in, the, in the appropriate period of time. Under standard operating procedures, failure to keep records, failure to follow the procedures you have or not having the procedures at all. Um, data analysis, inadequate investigations for out of specification results. Training, no documentation of training, no job description to state what training is required. Insufficient training to perform the activities of your job. Um, broken chain of custody for samples, improper sample identification, so barcoding that has the wrong sample label on it, things like that. Um, Reanalysis of samples, reanalyzing samples without cause or unnecessarily, not having a procedure that establishes how you reanalyze samples and when it's permitted. So those are the, those are the things that, that will bring you out of compliance. Um, any, any questions, be happy to address those. Again, we've touched on the high points um, of, of the regulation as well as what happens if you don't comply. And I thank you for your time today. Becky? Thank you, Diane. Really appreciate you sharing the great information. At this time, we'll open the floor to questions, should you have any. We invite you just to type in the chat box in the lower left of your screen. As a reminder, uh, the session has been recorded and will be available on our website. I'd encourage you to take a look at the website if you haven't already. It's usdatamanagement.com, and you can review our upcoming webinar events as well as uh, the recorded sessions of previously presented topics. And you'll remember the various areas um, of our practice specialty areas. And again, it's all about compliance, so take a look there. See if uh, the information will be useful to you or perhaps other departments in your company. We would, uh, I see some compliments coming in there. You're all very welcome. Thank you for posting that there. But we'd actually appreciate if you could take a moment and post feedback for us on our LinkedIn group page. We certainly welcome your insight and feedback. Uh, appreciate suggestions for future topics. What uh, pain points are you struggling with in compliance and how can we help with directions or solutions for you? Um, let's see, if you take just a moment out there, it really would be appreciated. Uh, our LinkedIn uh, group page again. In 2012, um, this is going to be an important indicator that our management team is looking at and using as a basis for the, whether or not to continue to fund our complimentary uh, webinar series. So thank you for taking a moment there. Let's see, our first question here appears to be from Jay. And, oh, it's another thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, it looks like uh, we are um, not receiving questions, so we'll go ahead and wrap up at this point. Diane, thanks again for presenting. We appreciate you taking the time. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. We know how valuable your time is, and certainly uh, appreciate that the information we're sharing is useful for you. We do appreciate the opportunity to team with you all in working towards excellence in compliance. Have a wonderful day.